What is it about a place that causes it to feel dear to people? It's difficult to pinpoint any single element, but in Jane Austen's novel, Pride and Prejudice, the main character, Elizabeth Bennet, is in the midst of conversation with her hosts, Mr. and Mrs. Gardner, as they tour the English countryside by horse and buggy. Beauty of the Peaks. Nature and culture in harmony, you see, Lizzie. Wildness and artifice, and all in the one perfect county. Well, I was born and grew up here, so I should never disagree with that. Where exactly? At Lambton, a little town of no consequence to anyone except those fortunate enough to have lived in it. I think it the dearest place in the world. <laughs> then I shall not be happy till I have seen it. Before Google Earth existed, you could revolve one of those globes that were present in every schoolroom in the U.S., set your finger on the state of North Dakota, and run it west until you felt wriggles of topographical elevation at that location in the southwest corner of Hedinger County, one perfect county, you would see the single word Mott. A little town of no consequence to anyone except those fortunate to have lived in it. Here too, residents think it's the dearest place in the world. Why does Mott appeal to many? It certainly isn't perfect, but it is home to many more than those who remain. It's a community with a history where people who know one another have lived for decades. It has had its difficulties, but a certain pride still remains. Every small town has had sons and daughters who have gone on to worldly success to instill that pride, and Mott is no different. Child of the snowy owl, child of the hawk hung sea. Mystic children of the grain, winter fields, golden dream. Your mothers of the northern blood, where the grass still blows free. There's a river running to the sea, and there's solid rock in the family tree I will swoop down in the womb of grace a northern night hawk diving in the dark I carry the love of a family name I carry the love of a family name Water whispered the ancient names to the children of the northern sea. An ancient song from Bethlehem sung by a Gaelic sailor saint. The owl swoops down in the womb of grace Northern night hawk diving in the dark They carry the love of a family name They carry the love of a family name Pride is also extended to our athletes and sports teams, and we revel in the visits from famous people who occasionally surprise us with their presence. We especially honor 
our fallen heroes, and those who served in times of war. And we note the singular presence of Mott on those schoolroom replogal globes, and how much Mott owes its charm to the Cannonball River that runs through it. It's this little river that now occupies our attention. Where did it come from? North Dakota historian Kevin Carvel, now residing at Mott on the Cannonball, tells us. The origins of the Cannonball River date back two million years. In prehistoric times, the Cannonball was one of the great rivers of this region. It's believed to have been created by an immense flood which covered most of southwest North Dakota and shaped the region's landscape. Before the glaciers, the Missouri River did not exist. As a result, the Yellowstone, Little Missouri, Knife, Hart, Cannibal, and Grand Rivers did not empty into it as they do today. Instead, the Little Missouri and Yellowstone merged north of Williston and flowed off into Canada. The Cannibal, meanwhile, was joined by the Hart River, southeast of Bismarck, and continued to the northeast to about where Devil's Lake is today. There it was met by the Knife and Grand Rivers. Their combined flow then headed north into Canada and eventually to the Labrador Sea. These ancient rivers' channels still exist, but are now deeply buried under glacial deposits. When the glacial masses advanced, they blocked these ancient rivers, forcing them to take new routes, flowing instead southeasterly along the front of the glacier. That created the Missouri River 25,000 years ago. And of course, the Cannibal now empties into it. How did the Cannibal River get its title? The Arikara, Mandan, and Hadatsa tribes had various names for it. For the Arikara, it was the river of many antelope. The Mandan just called it Big River. About the year 1750, when the Sioux began migrating west, they called it Stone Idol River. This is a possible reference to a holy site south of Elgin, a rocky point overlooking the Cannibal and known as the Oracle. Explorer John Evans, one of the first to make contact with the Mandan, called the river the Bomb. That was a reference to the sandstone balls found along the river's banks and which looked like cannonballs or bombs. What are these sandstone cannonballs? Geologists call them concretions, created by the hardening, the cementation of sand and silt, some of these stones are round, some long and tubular-like, and others have irregular shapes. As the landscape erodes from around the concretion, the Cannibal is revealed. The banks and valley of the Cannibal River once were home to uncountable spherical sandstone concretions that ranged from a few inches to several feet in diameter. Some are indeed the size of cannibals or even bigger. Poet Laureate has said, Another way of viewing the concretions, as the cannonball goes in its continual riffling cataracts and rolling overflow of the river it came to be, is how those who were formed in different shapes by its attendant pressure were rolled along in life by its gifts and its scrapes, and arrived in fullness of outward growth toward an eastern city or foreign state where they carried the essence of home and the cannonball to a further outpost adding western Dakota in its motmost to faraway Hawaii, Alaska, the lower 48 besides Europe and Asia and Africa of late.
American Indians were the first to live and walk along the banks of the Cannonball. Artifacts and other archaeological resources attest to this. According to a report of the Cannonball River Study Unit, plenty of evidence exists of early habitation from the Paleo-Indian archaic woodland, plains, village, plains nomadic, and historic periods. From the historic period, artifacts from the Lakota, Cheyenne, and other tribes exist. An article by Dakota Goodhouse relates the extensive American Indian history associated with the cannonball. Then came Trappers and Explorers, typified by Hugh Glass, whose story was recently turned into a Hollywood movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio. The true setting of that story was a nearby Grand River, actually, near Lemon, South Dakota. And when George Armstrong Custer and his troops headed west out of Fort Lincoln, near present-day Mandan, toward the Little Bighorn River in Montana, they followed for a good part of the trip the Cannonball River. We know this because several of the soldiers carved their names and the date on rock outcroppings along the Cannonball. We also should not forget the missionaries, notably Father Pierre Jean de Smet, the Belgian priest who, in the 1800s, evangelized Native Americans in the mid and northwest United States and western Canada. According to Carvel, The famed missionary made numerous trips through the west, many on the Missouri River. He also traveled by foot and horse across the plains and mountains. Although he passed through North Dakota 18 times, on only one occasion did he travel here on the open prairie. That trip, from Fort Rice on the Missouri and west into Montana, was along the Cannonball River in June 1868. Although he was already 68 years old and in broken health, he embarked upon the most perilous journey of his life to broker peace with the Sioux. His efforts resulted in the famous Fort Laramie Peace Treaty. Then came the settlers, and with respect to how Mott came to be situated on the Cannonball River, Hedinger County historian Enid Byrne reports. Before the advent of a railroad, the first settlement in a new country springs up near navigable rivers or near the seacoast. In 1904, when William Brown was looking over this section of the state, with the view of locating a trading point for the settlers that he was already bringing into the territory, he one night came to the old Barth Sheep Ranch, situated on the Cannonball River. And after spending a night along its smoothly flowing waters, he decided that the southeast quarter of Section 34, Township 134, Range 93, was just the place for his town. Every city and village is a mixture of nature and culture, wildness and artifice, existing more or less in harmony. Mott on the Cannonball is no different. Two developments of culture and artifice figure prominently in Mott's history. The first is the arrival of the railroads. These were not only important to the area economically, but also resulted in changes to the cannonball. In order to create a water supply for the steam engines of the Northern Pacific and the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul railroads, a channel dam was constructed around 1910. A happy consequence of this interference with nature was a reservoir that stretched almost a mile west to Bob Martin's crossing. And where settlements and rivers intersect, bridges must be built. The first steel bridge was completed in December 1907 and connected West Mott to Mott proper. The Mott Pioneer Press reported that the bridge presents a pleasing appearance and shows good workmanship in its construction. But this original bridge was replaced by Marsh Rainbow Arch Bridge in 1920. Based on a design patented by the Marsh Engineering Company of Des Moines, 
The new bridge was made of concrete reinforced with steel. The Rainbow Bridge became a landmark and icon of the community. Who remembers trying to run up the concrete arches defying the heights? Rumor had it that some brave boy actually went up and down the arches on his bicycle. In the early days, before all the silt accumulated in the river, the channel beneath the bridge was 12 feet deep, and the bridge served as a diving platform for the more adventurous. Sadly, that bridge exists no more. It was demolished and replaced by the present bridge in the 1990s. This bridge is thought to be less conducive to ice jams and floods that often resulted. Which brings us to nature and wildness. Engineers can try to tame rivers and bend them to their purposes, but their power to do so is limited. American Indians recorded a great cannonball flood in 1825, and Maud has seen floods in 1943, 1950, 1952, 1972, 78, 1997, and 2009. These floods on the cannonball often occurred when ice jams at the bridge caused water behind the jam to spill over the banks and flood West Mott. In April 1997, during the spring thaw, the river was swollen with runoff carrying ice chunks as big as cars. The ice chunks accumulated behind the bridge and dammed up the water behind it, and Westmont was flooded in minutes. Sometimes floods happen because there's just too damn much water, as happened the very next year after the old Rainbow Bridge was replaced. Rivers are often occasions for tragedy. Former Mottite and journalist Paul Weeks wrote a personal memoir for the Los Angeles Times in which he recalled a drowning of a young girl. This happened just east of the Rainbow Bridge. And then, one day on the beach, a mother scream. Milo Vets, older and a faster runner, clawed out of the water, raced up the beach, across the bridge, down the other bank to where a little girl, a classmate of mine, had slipped under the green water. Milo dived and pulled Katie to the shore. Adults worked her over. Out goes the bad air, in comes the good. The resuscitation method was different then, more primitive. I stood on the edge, new sensations and new thoughts, horror, bewilderment, curiosity. Katie's body, grayish blue and lifeless and new lines were cutting into the soft, smooth, gray matter of my head. And of recent memory was the devastating loss of Paul Naden and John Gifford, two high school basketball stars who were caught up in the boiling current of a spring flood in 1979. So living by a river can be deadly, but since it's a source of water, it's also life-giving. Before wells could be drilled, people and animals drank from the cannonball. They watered their gardens and crops with its waters. In the early days, there were few trees, and water from the cannonball helped bring into being the miniature urban forest surrounding Mott today. The trees of Bope Park next to the Mott swimming pool would not exist but for the Cannonball River water hauled as a labor of love by Edwin Bope with his horse-drawn wagon during drought years. In the early years, it was the center of recreation. People swam in it. Before years of extensive chemical farming and sprays, the water was cleaner. Back in its heyday, folks even water skied on it. In the winter, adults and children skated and played hockey. Children took excursions up the river, sometimes in little leaky old wooden boats. There was also fishing. Northern pike and catfish were commonly caught along cannonball shores from the earliest days. Later, you could catch walleyes and carp and, of course, bullheads were always present. This brings us to the present. What good is the Cannonball River in our day? 
Its original purpose, to provide water for railroad steam engines, is long past. And we don't need its ice for ice boxes. People still water lawns and gardens, but as sediment accumulates behind the dam, its usefulness for boating and fishing diminishes. It's still a natural phenomenon, uh, a phenomenon of beauty, and beauty should be cultivated for its own sake. To this end, some residents are beginning to plan for the restoration of the Cannonball River at Mott and beyond. Two projects are currently underway. The Merck Line Conservation and Charitable Corporation has acquired four acres below and to the west of the Hedinger County Courthouse. This wooded property, formerly owned by Spencer and Grace Merkline, was a wonderful area for gardening, bird watching, fishing, and camping for many generations of children. The plan is to develop the property as a garden for pollinators, birds, bees, butterflies, and other wildlife. It will have walking paths, flower gardens, grottos, and other attributes that allow people to enjoy nature. However, the corporation's front burner project is the Cannonball River Walking Path, a joint venture with the City of Mott, the Mott Park District, and the Mott Visionaries. The initial phase of this project will be to develop a walking path that starts at the dam and follows the river's path. Planned extensions will include a route to the old train bridge west of Mott and around the Mott Watershed Dam. An even more ambitious project would be to connect Mott and Regent with a walking and bike path along the Cannonball. The corporation would appreciate any suggestions and, of course, contributions. The Merck Line Conservation and Charitable Corporation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization able to receive tax deductible contributions. It is currently raising funds for the Walking Path project with plans to get work on it underway in 2019. The estimated budget for the first phase of the project is $25,000. The scope for future development along the Cannonball is limited only by the combined Mott imagination. Could we construct another walking bridge over the river into West Mott? Might we dredge portions of the river channel to create more fishing holes? Could we sponsor bird watching activities? Could we organize historical tours starting at the Missouri River and proceed along the Cannonball to points of interest along the way? perhaps following the route taken by Father DeSmet or George Armstrong Custer. Successful communities may thrive because of the accidents of geography and politics, but they can also thrive through intangible factors. Finally, geography played a major role in understanding communities. The location of the rail line, the interstate highway, the siting of the school, the bridge, or a ferry crossing often defined a community. Now there's a new force that defines communities and predicts their survivability. Beyond geography, economics, and theology, communities now must become places where people want to live. Not just where they have to live, people want to live where they feel accepted, at home, safe, and optimistic about the future. We believe the Cannonball River Restoration Project will create reasons for a variety of people to want to live in Mott on the Cannonball, and to preserve it as a town of perhaps no consequence to anyone except those fortunate to have lived in it, the dearest place in the world to its own. Circus. He 
wanted to sing a song down there Not a bad old guy Never made it to Woodstock Now he sings his songs at the garden gate Try it on Every size fits somebody And in your soul Well, you're never too late What is the song the minstrels sing To the Milky Way What's the song Down the street Singing his songs by the garden gate